Good evening, everybody. This is Dhanu Kumar Patanshetty, Senior IEEE Client Services Manager from IEEE. Thank you very much to everybody who has joined in. Welcome to the IEEE India Authorship Workshops. IEEE has been organizing this almost every year since 2014. And they have been overwhelmingly received in India and other parts of the world. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Joanne, Michelle, Kate, and several other staff members from the IEEE Operations Center in New Jersey, USA, and my colleagues from EBSCO Information Services in Delhi. I also heartily welcome Professor Gaurav Sharma from University of Rochester. He is the Editor-in-Chief for the IEEE Transactions on Image Processing and he is also an IEEE Fellow. Welcome to you, Professor Sharma. Thank, thank you, Dhanu. I also welcome my co-speaker today, Mr. Ranbir Singh Sade the IEEE Client Services Manager for India, Bangladesh, Africa, and the Middle East. Welcome to you, Ranbir. Thank you, Dhan. Today's agenda, I'll be giving you a brief introduction and background of this workshop. Then, Professor Gaurav Sharma will deliver the keynote address on getting started with IEEE publishing. Later, my colleague Ranbir will address all of us on various IEEE author tools and quick tips for students on how to maximize the utilization of the IEEE Explore digital library. IEEE, the world's largest technical association having more than 420,000 members across the globe and has a presence in over 160 countries. We have more than 2,000 student branches in over 100 countries. We are one of the leading technical conference organizers who organize almost close to 1,800 conferences every year. We are also standards developer and also publisher of journals, conferences, ebooks, and e-learning courses. At this point in time, if you visit IEEE Explore Digital Library, you will see IEEE houses more than 5 million documents in the platform. And we have more than 12 million downloads coming per month with over 5 million unique users. The main agenda of today is to help you understand how and why of publishing. Help you enhance the ability to develop high quality scholarly research papers. Help you how important the publications can play a role in your careers. This session will also help you share and disseminate critical information and emerging innovations with the global community. And also helping you choosing the best outlet by choosing the right quality journal in your respective fields. So let's start it. Get started with the second part of the workshop, getting started with IEEE publishing. I'd like to now call upon Professor Speaker to take it forward from here. Thank Professor, you, Dhan. Thank, you, you. Dhanu. thank you, Dhanu. And you are the presenter now. Sure. So I will share the screen. Can everybody see the screen? All right. Yes. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to be giving this workshop. I think last year I had the pleasure of giving the workshop in person. Hopefully everybody is doing well in these challenging times that we are living in and staying safe and healthy. So a uh, little, little bit of scope, what today's workshop will be addressing, as well as this is sort of a two-part workshop that IEEE is conducting for authors in India in October. Today's workshop is really much more about the basics, about getting started with IEEE publishing. This is intended for folks who are fairly new to publishing. So if you are considering being an author and not have not yet really sort of got your feet wet, this is sort of giving you the overview and the landscape of how to get published. And Thursday, October 15th, there will be a workshop which is more for authors who are already familiar with the basics of publishing. And that will be on how to publish a quality technical paper with IEEE. Some parts will be common between the two, but uh, there will also be some focus which will change between the two. Today's workshop will cover more of the basics. The workshop on October 15th will downplay some of the basics in favor of more of time for some of the more advanced questions. Just a quick note, the presentation is intended to be interactive. And when I give this presentation in person, I encourage questions from the audience as I go along. And that really makes it much more engaging both for the audience and for me. Okay. Now, that's not quite possible in the socially distanced times we are living in. So please ask your questions on WebEx using the Q&A feature. And the moderators will aggregate, prioritize, and ask the question to me on my behalf. They will be able to interrupt me and be able to ask. And as I already mentioned, uh, the two workshops have a slightly different focus. So the priority will be determined in part by the focus of the talk. In today's workshop, there will be a little more priority given to the basic questions. And then on the workshop on October 15th, the, the priority will be given to a little bit more of the advanced questions. For those. Okay. Right. So here's the outline for my talk. I'll begin with a brief background for myself. This will give you a little bit of understanding for where I'm coming from, what my experience is related to publications, as well as my professional career. Then I'll actually, I think uh, there's already an overview of IEEE that Dhanu did, so I will not be doing that. But I will jump into the basics of publishing. And I'll cover various aspects, like how can publishing help you and your career. This is, I'll be speaking from my own perspective as a longstanding IEEE member and author. I'll give you an overview of different types of publications that are there and how you may want to choose between them, what may be an appropriate starting point, and then go into sort of details about some guidance on writing a technical paper. What are the common arrangements? What is the common structure? What you may want to keep in mind by writing a paper? And then I'll cover aspects of peer review, which is useful to know when you're writing as an author and submitting and then branch from that to a discussion of ethics and misconduct, and then end with some conclusion summary of this part of the presentation. Okay. Roughly the plan is for this to be about 45 minutes, and then Ranbir will take on after that, and we'll talk about more of IT resources that you have available to you as a researcher and as an author. Okay. And there'll also be some additional references included in the slides. So as you have questions, please feel free to jump in and direct them on the Q&A session. Dhanu and Ranbir are the ones who will interrupt me on your behalf and ask me these questions. Okay. So just some quick professional background for myself. I'm currently a professor at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. Uh, this I'm hold appointments, primary appointment is the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, but I also have secondary appointments in computer science and in biostatistics and computational biology. My research interests are fairly diverse across a variety of IEEE fields. I list them over here. I will not read them. Okay. And I've published in a variety of these areas. So this is where I come from. Most people, when they think of New York, think of New York City. New York City is over here. So this is where New York City is. If you look at uh, where we are located, this is about 360 miles. So it's a fair distance from New York City. And this is showing you where Rochester is located in the state of New York. We are located on the banks. The University of Rochester is located on the banks of River Genesee. This is a river which flows northward into Lake Ontario over here. 
this is Canada on this side, and this is the boundary between US and Canada over here. And the X is marking roughly the location of the University of Rochester on this. Okay. This is our campus. Uh, this is what is called the River Campus. So this house is art, science, and engineering. It's a very pretty campus in summer. It's also pretty in winter, but in a different way, with a lot of snow. And the university actually has three campuses. This is the one which houses art, science, and engineering, which is what most of the fields you would be coming from. Additionally, there's an Eastman School of Music located downtown, which is one of the best schools of music for Western music traditions. And then on this side, not in the picture, is the University of Rochester Medical Center, which is a very substantial part of the university and much bigger part, including the medical center. The university is actually one of the biggest employers in the state of New York. They rank, I think, sixth or seventh in the state of New York. And this is our library on a bright summer day where we have our convocation. So this is just quick context in terms of where I come from. Obviously, right now I'm connecting from my home and a lot of the lectures I'm delivering are also from the home, as many of you may also be encountering in your own institutions, given the current situation. Okay. Quick note in terms of my publication background. Over my career, I've published a fair number of journal and conference papers. I also have a fair number of patents in this phase. Currently, I serve as editor-in-chief for the ITLB Transactions and Image Processing, and have previously also served as an editor-in-chief for the SPI and ISNT Journal of Electronic Imaging. This is not an IEEE journal. This is published by SPIE and the Society for Imaging Science and Technology. I also serve as a member of the IEEE Publications Services and Products Board, from which I've been serving from 2015, and have also previously served in other roles. Okay. So the reason for summarizing this part of my experience is that the perspective I'll be drawing from in today's talk will really be from my experience in publishing both as an author, but also from serving on as an editor-in-chief and as an editorial board member and on the IEEE Publications Board, where the policies for publications are set and issues are adjudicated when there are things, matters which arise. Okay. I also quickly mention, I have been, a, as I mentioned already, I've been an IEEE member since 1989 when I started as an undergraduate student member. And I'm currently a fellow, proud to be a fellow of IEEE. Hopefully, there are also student members participating in this presentation. I have fond memories of my days when I started with IEEE as a student member first. So the first point I'll talk about is why you may want to consider publishing. Okay. How publishing can benefit your career. But okay. So fundamentally, science is based on a tradition of publishing and advancing upon what already exists out there. So publishing is really the part where you're sharing your discoveries and knowledge with the rest of the community. I think Newton is credited with, with saying that I have gone thus far because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. So this is the tradition in science. People discover something, they publish and share with the community, and then people build on top of that and take things further, okay? Now, for you, this provides prestige and recognition. As an author, you get recognized for what you contribute to the community, okay? So people who originated the ideas first get credit for that. For instance, Newton is given the credit for originating the laws of motion, which all of us study in school, okay? This may also be required or beneficial if you're consist uh, if you're for an existing intended program or degree so if for instance you're considering graduate school you may want to consider publishing as a way to sort of establish that you're well suited for graduate school particularly if you're considering a phd okay and then assessment in some careers is based on publications so if you're in a career where uh, you, publishing is a key component of your job then assessments are also based on how much you've published I do want to highlight, even if some of you may not be thinking of a career where publishing is a primary goal, there are a lot of benefits that you come that come from actually trying to write an article and publish. Okay. In particular, writing really helps you develop your communication and presentation skills. Okay. This is critical in almost all careers. To the students I mentor, I tell them 
that uh, most people who they will who will have an influence on their career will have an occasion to look, judge them based on their communication skills and presentation skills. So this is really critical. And when you start writing, that is when you really start thinking about how you want to logically organize your thoughts and presentation. So that helps you in almost all aspects of presentation. Okay. And then it also helps you understand your own work better. This, is, this may seem paradoxical, but actually the process of writing really promotes logical thought of how you would organize this information and present. Okay. And this process also often gives rise to new ideas. You will have questions about why not try this, why not try that, prompted by the writing process. So I strongly encourage you to write and to take up writing and consider publishing your work. Okay. There are strong primary benefits and strong secondary benefits too for your career and your overall development. So today's workshop, uh, this obviously writing a paper, there are many aspects to it, and there are a lot of material that I could cover. For today's workshop, I will choose a subset of these topics, which are intended to somebody for who is just starting out and may not be that familiar with the publications process. Okay. So I'll cover a little bit of publication venues, writing your paper, give you a little bit of behind the scenes view into what happens in the peer review process, which makes a judgment about whether the paper gets published or not. And then some ethics considerations that you need to keep in mind, and then talk briefly about next steps before handing over to Ranbir. All right. So in terms of publishing venues, I think the key question that most of you would encounter is where do you want to publish, whether you want to consider writing a journal article or a conference, okay? So key difference between journal and conference articles, and this is not universal, but this is more or less the common case in most engineering fields, is that a journal article is much more of a comprehensive report. So this is expected after you've driven the research investigation to its logical conclusion, meaning all the open questions that you have, which are within the scope of the article, have been addressed and taken to their logical conclusion. You've done all the experiments that make sense in the context of the scope of the paper. It's not just, I have done experiment on one image and I'm making these conclusions, okay? So you have to have sufficient experimental evidence, sufficient work in order to justify what you are making the conclusions about. Okay. And these have to be strongly validated, maybe by statistical tests or by tests on data sets which are commonly used by a large part of the community and supported by those findings. Okay. A conference article, on the other hand, is a report that may be written while the work is still ongoing. So you can report work in progress, which may not be comprehensive. So it may still be things which you're doing, but you may have some preliminary ideas and some promising results from those. Okay. This is useful for establishing the precedence of ideas. So if you publish the conference article first, you establish who originated certain ideas. And it's also useful for early stage researchers to get feedback from the community. So you publish a conference article, you go and present your conference article, and people from the community can give you feedback in terms of what directions to pursue, as well as what else you may want to look at. Conference articles are typically short. They're about four to five pages, whereas journal article is usually much larger and a full journal article, for instance, would be 10 to 12 pages, sometimes 13 also. Okay. Professor, um, sure. sorry sure. to interrupt sure. you. No, no, please. Um, there's a question coming up. How does a review paper differ from a general paper? And okay. uh, uh, does review papers accepted in uh, the transactions on image processing? Okay, so that's a good question. So what I'll be talking about is an original research article. So Think about if you're going to draw a map of a particular area, you don't want somebody who, unless you know the landscape, unless you know what the full landscape looks like, drawing a map sounds like the wrong thing to do. You will just have a map which will misguide other people. Okay. So a review paper is something that you should attempt once you know the landscape of your area very well. Okay. So that should be somebody who's really experienced and who already has made original research contributions and has published. Okay. 
So I would encourage all of you at the earlier stage of to publish something original, publish something which is an original contribution, okay, rather than a review or a survey. Review and surveys are best written by people who know the perspective, have a perspective on the field, have originally or, or already contributed significantly to the field. So I know that number of you get advice when you're doing a literature survey that why don't you publish this as a review? And I think that's the wrong advice. Uh, the review paper is best written by experts in the field. IEEE transactions and image processing does not accept review paper submissions from unsolicited, unsolicited review paper submissions. Okay. The only, only exception to that is if there are already established experts, they can make a proposal and then that proposal is first assessed before they are invited to submit. So review papers are only by invitation prior to which you have to submit a proposal. Right. So hopefully that clarifies things. And from your career development perspective also, you are known for your original research contributions. So it's better that you focus on an original research contribution. So I already touched upon journals and conferences. Associated with that, you also have some considerations. The journal article is more fully developed, so it requires more time to polish. And then if it's not polished, there's a good chance that it will be rejected. Okay. The conference article, on the other hand, can be work in progress and promising results, but then also is a commitment to go and present at the conference. Obviously, in times when the conferences are happening in person, right now a lot of the conferences have also gone virtual. But in the virtual format also, you have to make sure you present your work. Okay, so that's a consideration to keep in mind, that in the conference, if you do not publish your article, your article may not be published as part of the final proceeding. So with that background of choosing between journals and conferences, I'll now jump into some tips about writing your paper. And these will be broader guidelines largely about structure that you may want to keep in mind, okay? So the best advice I will give to students who are starting out in writing is that as engineers, we learn from concrete examples. So the best advice for beginners to learn to write is to first learn how to read, okay? And for that, you should probably read publications in good venue starting at your level. So I remember my own time as a student and signal processing was the area in which I got started and that's what drove me towards research. And the signal processing magazine was one of my primary resources. Okay, the magazines are meant to be articles which are broadly accessible. So these articles are things which everybody should be able to read, even without a lot of technical background. IEEE Potentials, which is a student magazine, is also a great resource. This is a magazine from students for students. Okay, they have a lot of tutorials and surveys in these magazines. There are also tutorials and surveys in other journals, which you may want to start reading, okay? As you read, you will find that you will go through various stages. In the first stage, you will find that you probably will not understand a lot of the material, okay? In that case, the right thing to do is to go back at the references that are cited and to go to more fundamental material, go back further, and then look at what you can, from what stage can you start following. So a personal example I will give, is when I started looking at uh, research for the first time when I was an undergraduate student, then this was in 1989, when we could not follow the papers that were being published at that point in time, our advisor said, why don't you look at the references which are cited? When we could not follow those, he said, go back to their references. So pretty soon in 1989, we were looking at papers from around 19, late 1960s, 1969, 1968, which is what we could follow and then build our understanding to what was then in the current journal. Okay. So that's more or less some journey that you have to take for yourself. You have to build the background and then follow what is written. So once you start building the background, you'll be able to follow what is written in an article. Okay. Then you will develop the capability for discriminating what is good versus bad writing. Okay. And this is important because you want to read the well-written articles once you start discriminating good from bad, beyond that, the next stage will be, you'll be understanding what is not written in the article. So you're reading the article, not only for what is written, but what is unwritten. And this is often the next steps and next directions that you can pursue, okay? Open problems that you can pursue. So this is the stage at which you start becoming productive as a researcher. When you read an article, it inspires you to do new things based on your understanding of what has not been done. 
And there is an author you want to learn to emulate the well-written papers. You do not want to copy them, but you want to deconstruct what happened in the author's mind and to follow the same model in your writing for good writing okay? and not the poorly written papers. So that's the best advice I would give for somebody who's starting out that the best thing to do is to read and to read quite intensively and extensively. When it comes to writing, papers in the IEEE universe have a fairly common structure. Usually there'll be a title, authors, an abstract, introduction, the methodology that you're using, results, discussion of those, conclusions, and then acknowledgements and references. The acknowledgements may be optional. Okay, so here is an example. I'll be using this running example throughout this presentation. This is one of our papers, which I will use as an example. Okay, because I'm, as I'm most, most familiar with this. So the title is actually quite important. And the title should really be the one which answers the question for the reader. Is this article something that is relevant to me? Should I invest the time in reading this? Okay, so your goal is to describe the content of the paper in the fewest possible words. You should try and use keywords that are familiar to the community, but avoid jargon. Okay. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Okay. The first title that I have over here is something that I could use for any paper that I write. Okay. How we solved an important problem in a certain application. So the good part about this is I can use this for almost every paper that I write. And the terrible part about it is it does not tell the reader anything about what the problem is and what does this article really do. Okay. So this is, it's not specific. The second title is the example from the example paper I gave and the one which I will use through our presentation. Okay. This is about per color, per color channel, color barcodes for mobile applications and interference cancellation framework. Okay. So it's telling you what this paper is about. This paper is about color barcodes. It's telling you what kind of applications it applies in for mobile applications. What is the framework? The framework is doing things on a per column channel basis. And what is the innovation over here? The interference cancellation. So in a short title, we've summarized a lot of different things in this case. And that's what you want to aim for. And you want to aim for a title that is as short as possible, but sometimes you also have to allow for things being a little bit longer. Following the title is the abstract. And abstract is, in essence, a condensed version of the article, which in about 150 to 250 words is giving you everything about the article. What you did, how you did it, what are the main findings and conclusions? And why are they useful and important? Okay. So this is quite challenging to do this in 150 to 250 words. Mark Twain, who is sort of a very well-known US author, is credited with having said, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I did not have the time. Okay. To explain things in brief actually takes longer time than to write something at length, because you have to try and be selective while staying, still being clear. So a lot of times, starting authors will think the abstract is something they will put together at the very end, and then just put it together in a few minutes, just before the, when the article is all done, just before final submission. I would strongly advise you against doing that. Okay, You should plan, plan to spend a significant amount of time on writing, reviewing, and editing the abstract and this should not be an afterthought. Why? For most re readers, after the title, this will determine whether they will read the rest of your article. Okay. The reader will look at the title, then they look at the abstract, and see whether it's worth investing the time to read the rest of the article. So you want to, this to be as informative and to indicate to the reader what the article will convey to them. Okay. Also importantly, <clears throat> many of the decisions in the peer review process are dependent on the title and abstract. So take my journal, the ITP Transactions Image Processing. We get about 200 submissions a month. 
So clearly that is not something that I can look, read each paper in detail to figure out what the authors really want to communicate when they've not done their job of communicating that clearly. Okay. So I will look at the title and the abstract. And if based on the title and abstract, I cannot make out what the article is about and what its contribution is to the scope of the journal. Obviously the decision will be to reject without a full review. Okay. So keep that in mind that it's in your best interest to make sure you make the abstract as, as, as complete and informative as possible. So here's an example of an abstract. Okay. From, this is from the paper that I talked about. Okay. And this is by highlighting, I'm showing how it's addressing the different elements. So I won't have time to touch upon each of these, but it's talking about what is what we did. We're proposing a framework for color barcodes, how we did it by exploiting the color and channels for printing and the color channels for capture. What is the challenge? What is the technical innovation over here? Which is the fact that you have this interference between the channels, which you have to try and mitigate by some method. And what is the method we have for that? And what do we accomplish? We get a threefold increase in data rate. And what have we shown? Which are the main results? We demonstrated this on QR and Aztec codes. And then this shows you that you can do this with fairly low data rate. Okay. So some points here. The practice is to do this in the first person and present tense. Okay, that's the current practice in most engineering journals. You want to avoid unneeded words and sentences and be specific to the extent possible, focusing on the audience. Okay. I'll also critique this. One of the things about this abstract, the couple of things about this abstract, which I think are not that great. One is it is on the longer side. Okay. And that's something we decided to deliberately make it the case that way because not everybody would be familiar with the context. So we want to include a little bit of the context also. Not that many people may be familiar with the printing and the context for this. So we will include a bit of context in the abstract itself. So that's focusing on the audience. Okay. The second part, which is not that great, is that the main results, we are only summarizing in a qualitative way and not in a quantitative manner. Normally you want to make it as quantitative and specific as possible. And that's also a reason for that, which is that we're demonstrating this on multiple codes. So it's hard to provide all the data in the abstract without making it even much more longer and unwieldy. Okay. So the rules I will tell you about all those rules, you should think about the rule of common sense. Okay. And I cannot make any rules up to codify common sense. Common sense is something you have to apply on your own. So here's another abstract, which I took from archive and this abstract, I would give you, give, present to you as an example for not trying to emulate. Okay. So firstly, the first three words in this paper, well, what you're going to talk about is definitely what is in the paper. So wasting three words is not really a good idea. Okay. Uh, if you look at this, after reading this abstract, you'd be hard pressed to answer the questions which I pose over here. What you did, how you did it, what are the results, and how they move forward. There's all kinds of jargon over here. Even for somebody familiar with the field, you are a little bit left mystified in terms of what exactly is the contribution of this manuscript. So you want to avoid this. It does have a positive thing that it is short, but that's not the sole thing that you want to aim for. After the abstract comes the introduction. Okay. And the introduction is one of the most challenging parts for an early stage researcher to write. Okay. So my suggestion to early stage researchers is that you want to take notes for your introduction as you go along, but then focus on the writing after you have the rest of the work written up. Okay. Our introduction in our communities has a fairly standard format where you go from the motivation, talking about why this problem is of interest in sequence to generally known information of the topic. So you're going from a uh, broad reason for why you want to talk about this, what is generally known. So this is, general information to information specific to what you're going to talk about. So you're going from general to specific, then give an overview of the work that you've done, summarize the result and the contributions, and then describe how the article is organized. Okay. <clears throat> the introduction should be specific and not too broad or vague in its presentation. Okay. Roughly a target is for two pages and is normally written in the present tense. And one thing to avoid introduction is that you don't want this to be an aggregated summary of disconnected reference to past works. 
person A did this, person B did this, person C did this, okay? You want to think about some organization of how you are presenting this to the audience. Think from the, again, from the audience perspective. And also you want to avoid needless repetitions of the same point and tangential and irrelevant discussions. These are common issues that I see in abstracts that are submitted, in, sorry, in, in papers that are submitted in the introduction. Professor? Sure. Yeah, can I interrupt you for a few minutes? Sure. Because we have a lot of questions coming in, so I thought I will uh, ask a few questions here. So, what's the difference between a review paper and a survey paper? Are they both the same? A review paper and survey paper, from our perspective, are pretty much similar. Great. Um, why doesn't authors provide the base code for the research paper? Because many times results cannot be reproduced. Okay. So uh, they may, it may or may not be easy to provide code for what authors have done. In some cases, there's all kinds of experiments involved. You may use more than one piece of software and you may use a variety of things. So code is not always that easy to provide. It's also something which uh, as an author, as a starting author, the best way you can learn is by implementing something yourself. So I strong, the way I started on research, and then in that era, there was no code that was available. So you read a paper and you actually implemented it yourself. So I think there is mixed, mixed, mixed aspects to this. There is some benefit to providing code. So we provide code where it makes sense for and is easy to share. In other situations where the code is not really an easy artifact to share, we do not provide code for our work. Okay. So that's probably similar for different authors. And then the idea of the paper is the paper should provide a description which the reader should be able to read and then should then be able to recreate the work. And that's a good way to try and sharpen your skills also. All right. We have one more question coming up from uh, a participant who is uh, new to the publishing world. Uh, so he's asking how to figure out what area is the most interesting uh, for me to write about? Is it trial and error, or is there a more structured way to see what subjects intrigue us? Okay, so uh, that's a very good question. So I think the part of why you go to get go get an education is to also learn about yourself. Okay, so you're not only learning about materials, technical materials, but you're also learning about yourself. So what interests you, what intrigues you, and what drives you to sort of learn and publish is something you have to define for yourself. The best way to do that is by reading. If you read, you will start realizing, you know what, this is what I enjoy. This is what I enjoy learning about. That will be a, your window into trying to figure out what areas you want to work on. Last question, Professor. Sure. Is sure. it mandatory that we should present the uh, present present with experimental validation? Uh, if your paper is about something which involves experimentation, then you should definitely have experimental validation. If your paper is proving a theorem, for example, then it's purely theoretical. It does not need the experimental validation. But for almost most papers in engineering, there will be some experimental validation involved. There are some papers which are purely theory, but those are rather rare. And yeah. So yeah, so most papers would require experimental validation. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. So the next sections, which I will try and cover quickly, given that I'm also a little, already a little bit behind on time, is the methodology. This is where you're talking about what is the approach you took to solve the problem. So this will give a little bit more detail about the problem formulation, the process used to solve the problem. And then we'll have detailed description with text, equations, and figures. So you already introduced the problem in the introduction. But over here, you will have much more de detailed description where you will have equations, figures, and so on. So here you can use illustrations to provide an overview and illustrate the interconnection. Okay. So this, for example, is for our channel-wise framework. It's as simple as putting the barcode in the printing channels, and then you print them together, you get the resulting barcode. Following this is the results and discussion. This is where you are summarizing what is the experimental setup that you used, what metrics did you use? Your results will be summarized as tables or graphs as appropriate. If you want to show relationships between data points, use graphs. If you want to provide numerical values exactly, then you want to use a table. Okay. And the discussion is interpreting the results for the reader. 
where you are highlighting what is the benefit of your solution and also acknowledging limitations of the work and connections with other work which may not which may be appreciated better better after reading the proposed work a uh, final section in the paper is usually the conclusion. This is talking about what the research has achieved. And it's not a repeat of the abstract. So you should focus this much more on summarizing the main findings and implications of the field. It's also good to try and talk about the limitations. And the reason it's good for you to talk about the limitations yourself is that if they come to your mind, they will also come to the mind of the reviewers. By already summarizing them, you can deflate the reviewer's criticism for your paper. Also, this is the point to suggest future areas of research. In doing this, you should be careful. If things are such future areas you're suggesting are things which should directly fit in your existing paper, you should then work on those yourself rather than suggest them as future work. Right. <clears throat> okay. So here's an example of the conclusion from the paper that I was using as a running example. This is summarizing the main findings what the framework achieves, what does it allow people to do, and how does it benefit, and what are the limitations. It also talks about the limitations. Okay. Following the conclusion are the references. So references are for two purposes. One is to give the context for your research, what has been done in this related problem area first, and the other purpose is to acknowledge sources of ideas, where certain ideas came from. Okay. And so both of these are important, and you want to keep this in mind. There's no limit on the number of references, but use things which are relevant, okay? And make sure your references are complete. So the journals specify appropriate formatting conventions. Look at the journal, look at published articles, and follow those. You can make your life easier by using a citation manager. You can use BibTech, Zotero, EndNote, Mendeley for storing your references and for consistently formatting them. <clears throat> the style files are determined by what type of entry you're looking at, whether you're looking at a entry in a journal paper, which is the sec this entry 10 over here, an article in a conference, that is this entry 21 over here, or a book, and they have different conventions. So pay attention to detail is the basic idea. Which I would say. What stands between you and getting published is the process of peer review. Okay. So I'll give you a little bit of overview of peer review. Okay, this is what happens when you click submit your paper. The paper goes through a number of checks, first by the journal staff, then by the editor-in-chief, associate editor. If it passes all of these checks, it then goes on through formal peer review, where it goes on to anonymous reviews who provide feedback, and then that feedback may be conveyed to you to try and revise your paper and fix things. Okay. When you met all these requirements is when the paper gets published. All the people involved in this process, the editor-in-chief, the associated and the anonymous reviewers, are doing this as unpaid volunteers and volunteering their time to the community for the benefit of the community itself. So keep that in mind. So make sure that what you submit is appropriately written and has gone through the appropriate checks at your end. So value your own time as well as the value of the, as is the time of the editorial members, editorial board members who are contributing the time in the publication process. So I'll quickly touch upon a couple of points to keep in mind. So there's a variety of ethics issues that arise. The most common one which I see is the issue of plagiarism. And this is something which is a common source of confusion for early authors, so I want to touch upon this, okay? Plagiarism is when you use other people's words or ideas without appropriate attribution, and it's actually considered a form of theft. So you should always attribute your sources, even if they're informal. If somebody comes and gives you an idea orally or an email communication or via website, you should acknowledge where those ideas came from. And you should never copy other authors' words. When you're writing, the guideline that you should follow is that everything you write should be in your own words. And ideas that you have, which are inspired by others, should then be acknowledged by citation. Uh, very rarely, you may want to quote somebody, like you may see, say, Gandhiji said, and a quotation from Gandhiji. So that's very rare in our community. But apart from that, there should never be explicit use of words from somebody else. If you're reusing materials from any published source, they should be clearly acknowledged. So for instance, you have a figure that you've taken from a source, and you've drawn this. 
And if you redrawn the figure, then you should still acknowledge it and say adapted from. If on the other hand, you're using the directly, then you must get public permission from the author or publisher, depending on who is the copyright owner, and cite and acknowledge. Okay. You should also acknowledge your own prior published work. Okay. Right. So these are things, some other aspects which are there in the slides, and I will not have the time to speak about them, but I will just mention that you should not try and submit the same publication in more than one venue at the same time. Okay. So it's not a good idea to do this. This is just totally unacceptable in the technical community. So this is the point at which I'll summarize uh, in terms of some key guidelines. So one of the guidelines that I give to authors starting out is that you can and should start writing before you have all the work done and everything figured out. Because this is what really encourages you to think about what you need to do in order to drive this towards a complete manuscript. Okay. First, you should check for logical organization. Then you should address issues of clarity and brevity. Okay. So the first thing is the structure. Make sure you have a logical organization. Then look at uh, the issues of presentation. Check for conformance with the style of the journal that you're submitting to, both citations, sections, formatting, etc., language and grammar. Details matter. So if you have good work but it's presented poorly, it will not come out as being appreciated by the reviewers. Uh, the review process is not meant to, meant to be something which is iteratively editing, iteratively editing the manuscript. So don't think about it, that the review process will fix these issues. And finally, participate in your community. If you have a student branch, I would strongly encourage you to start sort of a practice in that student branch of where situations where the seniors mentor the juniors and teach them some of these aspects from their own experience. Okay. Other point which I will mention and I want to summarize this because this is a common problem with starting authors. All material, and there's no exceptions to this. Even in the introduction, we are summarizing prior work. The words are all expected to be your own. And for the ideas, you give the citations. So all material is expected to be your own unless you exp explicitly indicate this by quotes. Acknowledge the sources via citation and also acknowledge all related prior work, including your own. At this stage, I will hand over to Ranbir and stop sharing. And we will hopefully have time for some additional questions at the end after Ranbir's presentation. Thank you, Professor. Yes, you're welcome. I'll just share my screen. Dhan, can you give me the share rights? Yeah, just a moment. That'd be good now. Yeah, let me just. Just allow me one second. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for setting the ground. Uh, very good evening to everyone. My name is Ranveer Singh and I take care of IEEE client services for India, Middle East, Asia, Africa and Bangladesh. At the outset, I'm sure that you all are, you know, safe and healthy and following the guidelines of MHA during this pandemic. So along with my counterpart, Dr. Dhanu Kumar Patanishetti, who is today moderating the session, typically my role and Dhanu's role is to keep all of you updated on IEEE Explore Digital Library platform that contributes world's one-third literature in the field of electrical, electronic, and computer science. I'm sure that I've met most of you during my on-site presentation, Explore Awareness training sessions. If not, I hope to see all of you very soon once we resume to the normalcy. Considering the paucity of time, I mean, I think I only have six to seven minutes now. So please excuse me if I may sound a little bit faster, uh, but please be rest assured as uh, Dhanu mentioned that we are recording this session so that you can go over any segment of this presentation as required. A quick snapshot of uh, who we are, though Dhanu has given a brief description of IEEE, so I'll speak more on numbers. Apart from being membership-run organization, we do publish journals. There are nearly 200 plus journals, 
that we publish. Uh, those are active journals that welcomes all your manuscripts. manuscripts. Uh, we sponsor and co-sponsor around 2,000 conferences a year. So that means five to six conferences of IEEE is happening somewhere around the world every day. We are a leading standard developer. Today, if we are connected through Wi-Fi, if we are using uh, mobile devices that has the, uh, the capacity of Bluetooth, it is all because of IEEE because they have defined the set standard for these devices to allow the seamless flow of data in two different devices. Uh, one of the very famous standard of IEEE 802.1, uh, which is still an emerging standard not fully developed. And you will not believe that last year, more than 3 billion devices were being shipped on that standard. So that clearly gives an idea that how much IEEE is involved at the global level at the global economy. Uh, we also have a robust collection of ebooks uh, on the topics in engineering, computer science, and telecommunication. And we have also recently launched IEEE e-learning library with the more than 500 courses that can be very helpful for the working professionals. Yeah. So when it comes to technical spaces, IEEE is always on the top, but when it comes to impact factor, something which is not coined by us, which is coined by Thomson Reuters nowadays known as Clarivate Analytics, this is where we stand in electronic and electrical telecommunication automation and control system. So we keep a very close tab when our content is being cited in American Patent Office and European Patent Office. That clearly tells us that how valuable we are for the prior art search and the literature review. So IEEE is the only publisher in the world whose content is three times more cited than any other publisher. So today, if you are you know, uh, thinking on starting your journey with patenting, with copywriting, with the IPR, so IEEE could be one of your best resource for that. Uh, you know, at IEEE, we encounter more than 12 million unique visitors every month. And in order uh, to help authors to gain their visibility, IEEE has taken several initiatives. So one of the initiative, and I was also, I'm trying to recollect the question came on the code that uh, is there a base code available? So I'll just uh, tell you that now we have collaborated with CodeOcean. CodeOcean is also an organization, not-for-profit organization, just like IEEE, that facilitates the research reproducibility. So CodeOcean provides the cloud-based executable space wherein an author can upload the algorithmic or the mathematical code along with the article. The purpose of that code is to reproduce the output of the entire research within a few seconds. And because we have collaborated with CodeOcean, so the author will go to the platform, create the code. They can write the code in 16 different programming languages, C, C++, Java, Python, R, Hash, Boolean, MATLAB, etc., etc. And the, the, the best thing that I like about this new feature is that an end user can run the code, can download the code, and can also edit the code on the air and can see if this can bring new result to the research. As of now, there are 300, and 300 plus articles with algorithmic code. So if you want to you know, append your code with the article, all you have to do is go to the CodeOcean website, write the capsule, and give the DOI number of your article. IEEE Data Port is also one of the open science initiatives taken by IEEE recently. It's a web-based cloud service platform that will give you access to uh, data sets from different or the wide uh, uh, categories. So here you can see that if you're looking for a data set on astronomy, we have a solution for you. If you're looking for a data set on COVID-19 or ecology or demographic, we have a solution for you. At this moment of time, you can upload or download the data set of up till two terabyte for free. Yes, I'm saying up till two terabyte for free. Uh, one of the best thing about this platform is that we are hosting all these data sets, all these uh, uh, data set files on Amazon Web Services. So unlike Google Cloud and unlike uh, Microsoft Azure, there are a lot of web analytical options that are available with Amazon Web Services. So whenever you get time, you can also visit this website, IEEE Data Port, that can help you to boost your research to the next level. 
So now when professor has explained you in detail, I'm sure that all of us are excited that how can we start, how can we kickstart our publishing journey, our writing journey. So, you know, to ensure that your research problem must contribute to new and important knowledge. That is very important. It should be new and important as professor was mentioning again and again. The very first thing that the author will do is he will conduct a literature review. Now to conduct a literature review, there are different options that you want to choose from. Number one is you should have an access to a database like IEEE Explore Digital Library that uh, clubs more than 5 million plus full text documents. And there are other relevant scientific publishers apart from us that you can look for. Apart from these publishing databases, you also have an option to look deep dive into abstracting and indexing databases. And last but not the least, your library, your library staff, your librarian is the best person to guide you in this regard. So, you know, when you start the search on IEEE Explore Digital Library Platform, this will bring you to the homepage of our website, IEEEexplore.ieee.org. Uh, typically, we use IP authentication, uh, which is a seamless authentication as long as you're inside the campus. But since we understand that most of you are working from home, so we have created the uh, temporary username and password for all the end users, and you can collect all those temporary username and password from your library. So, you know, that's the homepage of IEEE Explore Digital Library Platform. And this white box is what we call it as a basic search box or a global search box. So you can use the quotes so that the, it is easy for a search engine to deep dive into 5 million full text documents and get your relevant uh, article. One of the important tips that I would like to give you is the purpose of uh, this database, IEEE Explore Digital Library Platform, is to save your time. So there are so many Boolean operators and proximity operators available that you can you know, incorporate uh, during the creation of your search query that can save your time. But the rule is always use all the operators in capital letters. The example which I'm showing you, for example, I want to search something on data mining and neural network. So just use the operator in capital letter so that, so that the search engine understands that you are searching between string one and string two. You are not trying to search something on the word and. So once you hit enter, the result set will be bifurcated into conferences, journals, courses, and books. We also include early access articles. So we try to give you access of something which is about to publish in next one or two months. So those are, uh, are uh, all the articles which are ready for publication, peer reviewed, but not yet published. So you can get access to the upcoming research in early access articles. On the left hand side, you can see a variety of facets that can help you to narrow down your uh, result on the basis of uh, year, on the basis of on the basis of affiliation. Uh, you know, for me, these are not just options to filter my research, filter my result, but these are uh, research oriented options. For example, if I want to, you know, know that which publication title is uh, publishing maximum number of article on data mining and neural set, then probably I can easily get to know from these faces. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, we have a dedicated option to sort your result. By default, it is by relevancy, but we, you can also sort your result by uh, most cited by papers or most cited by patents. And recently we have included one option, most popular. You can also uh, sort your result by most popular, which will give you access to all those uh, article which are most downloaded. So that could also be one of your matrix to decide, you know, whether you would like to read that article or not. We have started capturing the author detail profile pages. Now, when you click on the author name, it will give you a quick snapshot of the author, of all their co-authors, number of paper that, that the author has published, the publication year, a brief biography of the author, and uh, you know, underneath the, the direct link to the individual publication from that particular author. And if you look at the picture, um, this is fortunately, we got uh, Professor Gaurav Sharma and uh, you can click on follow this author and you can 
get emails right in the inbox on weekly basis if Professor Gaurav Sharma is you know, about to uh, publish new articles or new papers with IEEE Explore Digital Library Platform, which I'm sure he is planning. So apart from basic search, we also have a advanced search for you or a command search that will give you a lot of uh, uh, data sets, uh, data type option wherein you can uh, uh, you know, use operators, you can create the nested search terms, you can use the proximity operators, you can use the data fields like if you want to uh, search only on DOI, if you want to search only on author affiliation, if I'm going for an interview in Microsoft, can IEEE Explore help me in that? I would say yes to some extent. I mean, if I quickly do the search on the author affiliation of Microsoft, I will get a quick understanding what micro Microsoft is researching into. And during my course of interaction with the interviewer, you know, I can mention that I was reading that this is what we are doing these days. That probably could turn the table. That's what I feel, and that can really help you. So, you know, feel free to use the advanced search in the command search to create more complex and nested searching. And last but not the least, one of the most important feature of IEEE that I'm a big fan of, that it gives you an uh, option to create your personal account. Now, you know, there's a difference between Google and us, as there's a difference between search and research. So what we do on Google is search, and what we do on a publishing database like us or any other publisher is research. So in these publishing databases, when you create a personal account, so I, it's now IEEE's responsibility to start sending you emails on the weekly basis based upon your search string. So you are not reinventing the wheel again and again. You are just doing a search for the first time, and then you just have to sit and relax. You just have to keep a tab of your phone or your tablet, and we will send you an email whenever there is a new content on your area of interest or on your area of research. IEEE author tool, uh, you know, to accomplish the mission of uh, our organization, which of course is uh, the advancement of technology for the benefit of humanity, we continue to support researchers and authors. So one of the initiatives that we have taken is uh, we have created a dedicated web portal uh, that is helpful for authors in all the ways. So authors at all the different stages from beginner to you know, intermediate and advanced level can understand the three key aspects of publishing that is writing, peer reviewing, and, and the publication. So this is a one stop for all the authors to give you answers of all your questions from A to Z of publishing. Uh, one of the tools that I like most on this uh, platform that is IEEE Author Center platform is IEEE Publication Recommender. Uh, publication Recommender helps you a lot because I mean, uh, it's easy to say that we have 200 plus journals, but for an author, it is quite confusing when they'll see that, you know, uh, there are many journals where the names looks almost same and the aim also looks almost same. So how the author will decide that this is the best journal for their, for their first paper. So when you come to IEEE publication recommender, all you have to do is just give the keywords from your research paper. Just give the index terms of your research paper and the publication recommender will recommendation on the basis of subgroup of time, on the basis of uh, impact factor, and on the basis of open access availability. And it will also give you recommendation from the upcoming conferences. So it can save a lot of time for you. And at the same time, it can give you different option if you would like to you know, go for a journal which is an open access journal, or if you want to go for a journal which is a traditional journal. And then there are other important tools like IEEE Graphic Analyzer, which can really help you a lot in ensuring the high quality of your graphics. That is also core to the paper. And then the IEEE Latex Analyzers to make sure that your code is okay, it's not you know, breaking up anywhere. IEEE reference preparation assistance. So I would recommend to you that whenever you get time, just go through this IEEE author center. And one thing that I forgot to mention is uh, most of the answers on this uh, author center is in the form of video. So, you know, you are not just reading a text, 
that may you know uh, may you know take your time or consume your time or you may feel bored but when you go through the answers uh, you will see all the solutions and all your answers are given in the form of video so you know whenever you get time just come and visit ieeauthorcenter.ieeauthor.org there are some additional resources some additional references apart from author center so we'll be sharing this uh, slide deck with all of you and you know you can uh, uh, get acquainted with all these uh, uh, links that will help you in your uh, technical paper writing whether it is periodical or conferences these are some key sites to remember ieee author center that i have already shown you uh, we are always keen to know if there is any upcoming conferences in my area you know so from wherever you belong so ieee.org ieee explore digital library gives you access to more than 5 million plus full text documents ieee explore information center and training tools there are all uh, tutorials that can help you to uh, give tips and tricks on the basic searching on the advanced searching on the command searching and the jcr report ieee general citation report that's the link for that so you know with this uh, i'll say yes i have already crossed the time limit i'm sorry for that and i will hand it over to professor and uh, to dhanu uh, the, the the session is open for all the questions thank you very much Thank you, Ranbir. Uh, professor, we have thanks for answering um, a few questions uh, in the chat window. So uh, those who have uh, asked questions, please look out the chat window. You have uh, probably you have answers, but uh, there are a few questions. Probably I'll be asking uh, Professor now. Uh, uh, is it mandatory to compare the results with any existing work? If there is no related work, then what is the solution? Professor, if you can unmute yourself. Okay. okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So if there is existing work in the field, then it is more or less accepted. The accepted practice is that you should compare your results to the existing work and to justify why you have advanced, how you have made an advance. That is the way things move ahead. Okay. Now you can uh, advance in different directions. You may advance in terms of improvement of the results. You may advance in terms of requiring lower computational resources lower energy, lower computational power. You can also advance in terms of uh, something which is for a particular application setting, okay? So think about that and think about in what ways you can advance. But yes, if there is existing work, normally it's expected that you will have some comparison with those. Otherwise you have to strongly justify why such a comparison is not appropriate. So your job is to justify the publication of a paper in view of what has already been published. So if there is already existing relevant work, then you have to either indicate why that is not relevant for comparison, or you have to present comparisons. Okay. If there is no prior work on the problem that you're developing, then you have to also indicate that. And then if the reviewers find prior work, clearly they will say that those, those claims are not substantiated. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, one more question. Uh, can a framework be published theoretically without the results? Uh, yes, if you're publishing, if you're doing something conceptual, which involves only theory, like proving a theorem, then you can publish that without really having direct experimental results. Okay. Also, in some situations, you may not, if experiments are more challenging to do, you may do simulations, and you can publish results from simulations. Sure. One more. Uh, suppose I'm working on a paper on deep learning. So do I need to go into detail, writing everything from scratch, or can I start from a common point? And if yes, then what should be the point and where I can start from? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, the point you should start from is determined by what audience are you targeting. Okay, if you're working on deep learning and you're trying to go to a conference which is on particularly focused on deep learning techniques, then you clearly should start from existing techniques and then show how your technique has advanced thing. Okay. If you're working on a deep learning application, then you should start from the point at which people have addressed that application, either with deep learning or with other techniques, 
and then build beyond that. So really think about your audience. Who are you targeting? Are you targeting somebody who's doing the methods? Are you targeting somebody who's doing the applications? Which, which is your audience? And then appropriately write for the right audience. Thank you. Uh, we have one more coming up. Um, if an algorithm is not the core aspect of the paper, do we need to compare them to others? If the algorithm is not the core aspect of a paper, do you need to compare them to others? Uh, maybe not, but if the algorithm is not the core aspect, if the engineering aspect is not the core, core aspect, so if it's not an algorithm, it could be a device. In the IEEE fields of interest, you could divide, devise a new circuit, a new device, a new electronic device. So all those, then in that case, you have to justify the existence of the, the advantages of the new device or the new, new yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you're, okay. So if you're, if this is purely an application, so there's the distinction is if you, you must have some novel, technical novelty in the IEEE fields of interest if you're looking at publishing this paper in IEEE. If you're purely doing this as an application to a particular area, okay, then maybe that area may be a better area to look at. And in some areas, IEEE does have publications. In other areas, the application may be in different fields, maybe in the medical fields, for people to judge and assess whether this is appropriate or not. So an example I will give is for the transactions and image processing. Our focus is on new techniques for image processing. Okay. We sometimes get papers which will take existing techniques, apply them to medical data, and say they can diagnose cancer this much better than existing techniques. Okay. Now, the expertise of judging that and to see how useful that is, is not in the transactions and image processing. That's more in the medical community. So in that situation, the recommendation I will give to the authors is your paper would be better suited for a medical journal where people can assess it and can say whether the methods you've used and the conclusions you've drawn are supported or not. So think, keep that in mind. A follow-up question uh, on this, Professor. Is it compulsory to include uh, mathematical-based support for the proposed algorithm? Uh, for most work that you're publishing, it will require some sort of, it, it is rare that you will not have some sort of mathematical expressions in your paper to justify what you've done and to describe what you've done clearly okay so what is the you should not have equations for the sake of equations but equations can really summarize and precisely what you have done in a much better way than just words can so as opposed to sort of purely a description purely in words if you give equations give a description of an algorithm with steps that are there in the process and so on that can be much more precise. So the purpose of the publication is to describe to others what you have done and how they can reproduce that. So the paper by itself should meet the requirement that by reading the paper, somebody should be able to reproduce your work. So from that perspective, the mathematics often becomes a key requirement. Thank you, Professor. Uh, last question. We, uh, we're actually uh, getting a lot of questions, but I would um, request all the um, participants to send out an email to us. We'll be sharing the email ID at the end of this uh, session. Ranbir, if you can um, forward your slides to the last slide, that would be great. Uh, Professor, this is the last question from a student. Uh, does a published paper help me in getting admission to master's? Okay. Uh, so if you, so does a published paper help you in getting admission to masters? So that depends on what paper it is, where you have published it, and what masters program you're applying for. Okay, uh, if it's directly relevant to your your field of study that you're applying for, then definitely it helps by establishing that you've already done some initial steps towards research in your area of interest, and you've taken the initiative. You also learned something possibly about publishing and in participating in the publishing endeavor. So if you're considering a thesis for a master's and applying for a master's thesis program, then you already have a starting point. You've already done the, learned something about what is involved in publishing. So it depends on the program you're applying for, but it can be a, a positive. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Ranbir, if you can put the last slide, that would be great. 
Uh, professor, thank you so much. Uh, my, my pleasure. My pleasure. Addressing uh, everyone today, even I could learn uh, some things uh, from today's session. Uh, thanks to Ranbir uh, for giving a glimpse of the IEEE Explore and the IEEE Author Tools. Uh, we look forward, um, everyone, to join the follow-up session on 15th October. It will be a bit advanced and it would uncover uh, many more facts about uh, the authoring. So, uh, request all of you if you uh, if you have any more follow up questions, please do send out an email to us at authors at IEEE.org. Uh, if you have any issues or concerns or any questions related to as accessing the IEEE papers, uh, that is from the IEEE Explore digital library, uh, please send out a note to online support at IEEE.org. We have several departments within uh, the IEEE itself, and if you would like to have uh, to know more about uh, the copyright policies or permissions and reuse, uh, we have the email IDs displayed over here. Also, I uh, will be sharing these slides and everybody who attended this session will receive a certificate. Once again, thanks to you, Professor, and my colleague Ranbir Singh, and my colleagues Joanne, Michelle, and Kate, and also my colleagues from... My pleasure. Hopefully, everybody stays safe and healthy these times. Please take care. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. And we are going to end this session uh, now. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, please uh, uh, look into inbox. We'll be sending the recording and also the certificate to all of you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Have a good evening.